once anyway, huh? There's no bed tonight? No. No? Oh, all right. I will go to the meeting before I really get to have these microphones off. Where is he? In, so. Where's the guy who's doing the video? He's in the video room. They're on air. Okay. Um, I'll call the meeting to order. Um, I'm Dennis Brennan, the town historian. And um, the chair of the committee, Ben Spear, is away uh, today. So I will be chairing the meeting tonight. Uh, first order of business, I guess, is approval of the meetings from the September 15th meeting. Uh, everybody read through those meetings? Yeah. Anybody have any additions? Mostly your change? report. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I wasn't there. I know, so. but we incorporated your report. Yeah. So it was so well written. Oh. Uh, so uh, vote on acceptance. Does somebody want to move? So move. Second? Yes. Second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Okay. So we accept the minutes as they were read. Uh, Town of Storing's report, next order of business. <clears throat> um, as I just said, I guess it, to say it's good to be back isn't the whole truth. I had a wonderful time up in Canada. And, uh, the weather was good. We had some car problems, but they, we resolved those. And lots of relaxation, so it was, uh, it was a good time. Um, first thing I'll talk about briefly is the Historic Preservation Commission for Niskayuna. Um, Historic Preservation Commission was created, or the code was passed last April. The commission was finally appointed at the September meeting of the town board. There's five members on the, on the committee. Uh, we met last Monday on the 17th. Mostly welcomes and introductions, but we did agree to meet regularly on the third Monday of each month. Um, one of our first tasks will be to establish a criteria and an official listing of homes that could potentially be listed on the, the town's register of historic places, so an inventory of historic homes in the town, and then to establish, uh, to move forward and establish procedures and processes for determining um, homes that want to be listed on the town register of historic place. So that's going to take a few months to get put together. But, uh, we're beginning to move along, and I'm happy to see that happening. Are there, are there candidates for positions on the commission uh, thus far? Right now, we have five members on the commission, and they want to keep it at five. Uh, Personally, I'd like to expand it a little, but we'll see what we see how that happens. And, and unfortunately, one of the members, Jim McKinney, I think I've talked about in the past. Jim McKinney's a retired engineer, architect, preservation specialist who has uh, volunteered to work on the railroad station and the Ro Rosendale School, the Common School, Grange. Um, unfortunately, he's had some health issues, and uh, he's confined to home for the moment. But, uh, so I'm, I'm hoping he will uh, be back with us really soon because he's done a lot of preservation work uh, in his in his official, I mean, when he was in business for himself. So he knows a lot, an awful lot about preservation and ways to get the grants that we'd like to get to, uh, to rehab certain buildings. Um, this kind of railroad station renovation uh, again, little has been accomplished on that with me being away and then Jim getting sick. He was he was away for a week or so in September, wound up coming back and spent, unfortunately, most of September in the hospital. And so he's, uh, uh, <clears throat> that's on hold, although he's done a tremendous amount of work and provided us already with a lot of uh, schematics and drawings and ideas about what we can do. So uh, hopefully... Even if he's not going to be involved for a while, we'll have something to work on to maybe move forward. Um, town logo work group that is grouped together to um, redesign the town logo to fix some of the errors in the logo. Um, we also met this, well, we met on October 5th, um, discussed the, there were some questions, a graphic designer who was been meeting with us gave us sort of 
consider a best approach to how to address the, the town board, the town residents in terms of what to do about changing the logo, what they would like to see on the logo. Um, and uh, with it, in this regard, we're going to be working in collaboration with the uh, 2023 Comprehensive Plan Committee. Uh, we're going to be doing a similar process of talking to residents about uh, moving, you know, changes they'd like to see in the town, why they like the town. That's something I've added to the agenda for, because I thought we'd discuss it here, um, added to the agenda for new business a little bit later. Uh, I want to get some of your input about your ideas or your thoughts about questions that should be asked as we prepare the comprehensive, the next 10 years comprehensive plan. Um, as far as the logo is concerned, we're gonna continue working, continue meeting, and we're hoping that we'll come together, come, come up with enough ideas, suggestions, or thoughts that uh, we'll be able to present something around the time of this today in 20. Uh, comprehensive, plan. this is why I didn't want to come back maybe, another meeting. Uh, comprehensive plan uh, met on Tuesday, the 18th. Um, well, each of the members was assigned one or two neighborhoods to walk around, start to take pictures of, uh, and ideally over the next month or two, meet with some of the people in the neighborhoods and talk to each neighborhood about about Niski and why are you in Niski and what would you like to see change, et cetera, et cetera. So we talked about some of that. Um, and um, next month we're going to continue that process uh, as well as try to work out a vision statement for the new comprehensive plan. Uh, most of the members have already submitted a vision statement and one of the members of the committee is going to Try to identify all the similar ideas and come up with something. It's sort of a preamble to the to the confidence. Who are we as a town? This year? What are our principal ideas, principal vision for what's going to happen over the next ten years? Um, the um, Schenectady County Library video. We talked about this last couple of times. I was here at any rate. Um, but, Again, Schenectady County Library organized a show and tell uh, uh, meetings uh, for I think nine or ten of the historians or people interested in history around the town to do a little video about some artifact or some part of their town. I did one on the uh, bridal chest that we got from. Mm -hmm. Joel Bazoin, Joel Bazoin out of the, the uh, Frigier House. Uh, <clears throat> but anyway, they um, they have finally organized, so they, they were finally released October 4th. Um, I do have in my, I can send this to you, to you all, but I do have the link uh, to the, the nine presentations uh, on the uh, county County Public Library YouTube site, or you can just go to the YouTube site and find them. Uh, Winnie plaque. Um, location for the plaque. I think last I talked about this, we were still working on trying to establish the location of where it could go. or some concern about whether, it would, whether we needed some sort of legal changes or legal... Uh, documents in order to place it properly. Um, but it really turned out to be a question of making sure we don't block the view of the, the homeowners there. Uh, so that's all worked out. So we know where it's going to go. We put in a stake. Michael and I put a stake in the ground uh, with the uh, stringer's permission uh, where it'll go. Uh, now it's a question of just uh, deciding when we're going to have an unveiling or a dedication ceremony. Uh, but it won't be until the spring. Uh, the supervisor feels like she needs a little more time to decide how to how to plan this. We also, if we're going to have a dedication, need to give Pomeroy Foundation at least three weeks notice before it is. So that would put us into November and sort of concern about the weather. At that point. 
Um, so I'll keep you informed about that. Um, the only other thing I have is something I haven't done anything about, but I've been asked to do something and looking into the uh, Hometown Heroes program, seeing if we can start something in this unit, in the town of Miskiuna. I was hoping Kellen might be here because I think she's talked about that in the past. Um, Is that the flag? That's the flag, yeah. Um, so anyone who has any information about that, I'd appreciate it. Um, I'll maybe reach out to Kellen myself um, and see if she can, uh, she can provide some information. Who, who manages that? I don't know. <clears throat> I've tried. There is an order. There is. It comes through the Schenectady Chamber of Commerce. There is some sort of a program, uh, but I haven't been able to find a name of somebody who organizes. Um, Kellen, I think, has some information about it. Is that the hometown hero banner? Hometown hero yeah. banner. Yeah. Do you know? Did you know anything about it? Or? No. Oh. <laughs> I'm curious. Yeah. No. That's fine. <laughs> I got someone who may know. Well, if you do, I, if you could reach out to somebody, I'd appreciate it. Uh, all right. Anybody have any questions about my reports? Any? It's basically a quiet month for me since I was away for a good part of it. Now things are back to getting active again. Well, <clears throat> Next, we'd have the chair, chairperson's report, which the chairperson isn't here uh, today, uh, but I'll at least read the mission statement, as we do every month. This Unit Historical Advisory Committee supports the town, this town historian's efforts to research, communicate, educate, preserve, and advocate for the distinctive history of the town of this unit. Uh, <coughs> subcommittee reports. Um, Education Committee, not here. I'll pass on that one. Gleanings Committee. Um, the uh, article in the Gazette uh, for October was, uh, I did that one, is the boy's life in 19th century Neskiuna. That, that was a great one. I got a number of very positive comments about that. It's interesting. And, and I think that showed great imagination on your part. I don't know where you got the, 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 uh, the information from, but the way that you presented it, <laughs> tried to you. Right. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it was really it made a compelling story. Yeah. It was interesting. Chuck gave me some documents from his his mother. I included a recollections by Conrad Meesick, which had been preserved, I guess, by Guy Meesick. Uh, I don't know. They're all in the first person, so it's Conrad's voice, uh, but I think Guy must have typed them up at some point in time. And it's his memories of what it was like when he moved here and 1864, 1865, and then went on. Um, I thought it was, and one of the other things fascinating, talking about the Little Red Schoolhouse, which had to be the Rosendale Common School, or at least where the Rosendale Common School is now. Now it may have been changed at some point. It's been there a long time. You mentioned the sawmills and the sawmills and swimming in the pond. Uh, yeah, it was, uh, he said a lot of little details. Uncle Billy. Is that the leash again? Yeah, yeah. So it must have been flowing pretty strong back then. Yeah. The power of mill. It doesn't it seem like it's quite so powerful now. Yeah, I don't know how they did it. Maybe they. I don't know if they got changed the when Route 7 got, you know. Well, it got changed. Well, it got changed when the river, when the. Uh, the Barge Canal. Uh, that made a big difference. Uh, exactly how, I don't know. I'm not enough of an engineer. I'm not an engineer at all. <laughs> um, but yeah, that was fun to work on. And I, I didn't have a picture of Conrad. 
I don't know whether there are any. He, in his mem in, in his uh, recollections, he does talk about having uh, pictures and direct. Uh, what do they call them? Before before photographs, what do they have? Derogatites? Well, and um, but I, I don't know where those are. If they're all even destroyed. Yeah. Um, so that's why I did the map. They've identified some of the areas. So um, actually, I, that idea hit me because of Michael's map in the <laughs> in the previous article. Oh, yeah. <laughs> so that, that, that works perfectly. Um, I'm scheduled to do the article for November. I haven't decided what it's going to be yet, but I got some time to get to December. If I can get this fine point in stuff, I've spent hours doing the research. I've got plenty of material now. It's a matter of sorting through it and writing it. This is on the... It's called the Pine Point Inn. It was the probably the most popular restaurant celebration place. And it sits, it sat over where the Schenectady Trusco is now, on the corner of the intersection of Ball Town and Central Avenue, State Street, where mm -hmm. Albany, they called it the Albany Road back then. Mm -hmm. But it was right on, right on that point there. And I went down to the uh, Historical Society and we dug through some old maps. And we have, we have it located on a map segment oh. that shows exactly where it sat. So it had parking all around it. You could access it from both roads, plus it was on the trolley and bus lines. So people, it was advertised in the papers quite frequently. There were an interesting number of characters there. They got busted for gambling big time once. And they burned ten thousand dollars worth of uh, roulette wheels and dice tables <laughs> and other kinds of things. They actually police took it to Latham, the state police, and burned it. They and then they find all the people they arrested there. I mean, they burned up the, the roulette wheel? Yeah, yeah. I talked to him. Trying to make a statement, I guess. <laughs> when when did that happen? The bus took place in about 19, in the 1930, 31. And they, the couple of the underworld guys that used to hang out there were pretty notorious. But then the owner that took it over and in Pulver, Pulver, Pulver. He died and his sister took it over and she seemed to clean up. She ran it for like four years. She ran it very well. It was like the place. I mean, all the top legislature people from Albany, the president of GE, Union College, churches, all had celebrations there. They had weddings of three or four hundred people. So. This guy put in a big dance floor. It was they had bands there on Saturday nights and holidays. It was quite a hot big place. It didn't work well. She made it her residence as well. She lived there until the sixties. But when did the when did the establishment begin business? Well, you know, roughly hard hard to figure. It was this guy uh, Ambrose Hover. He started running it in about 28, and he bought it himself from a real estate guy he was operating it for in 31, because we've got all the transactions mm. in the paper. And he died two years later and willed it to his sister. And Nan, Nancy took it over, and she ran it. She was married to a pretty wealthy businessman from New York City, but she chose to live here. She made the place her own. And she ran quite well, apparently. She did very well. It was real estate people would advertise houses in the area, and they would always give near Pine Point Inn as, the, as everybody knew the location. I thought it was funny to watch the stops on Central Avenue. Sometimes it said stop one, sometimes stop five, stop six, and I think that's Probably the transition when it went from trolley to bus lines, the stock numbers may have changed. But the address is the same as the Trusco Bank right now, so it was right exactly where the Trusco Bank is now. And the Stanford's own that 
property at one time. It might have been a tavern in the early days. Stanford had a huge. Uh, they owned that whole yeah. property, and it was uh, they raised horses. It was a big farm. They raised uh, uh, we call the trotting horses from Saratoga, not the thoroughbreds. Before it became the golf course. Well, no, the golf course was kind of across the street. Oh, where I thought the that mall was, yeah, is now. Yeah. This is that other property where Ingersoll Home is oh. now. That was Stanford's home, yeah. and it's moved a couple of times now. It's a bank as well. Don't remind people. <laughs> well, that was too bad. That's what people are upset about that one. <laughs> yes, yes. We didn't like all that yeah. movement. Anyway, it's, it's way more than 800 words, but I got to figure out how to bring the scope down. I certainly got plenty of material. One of, one of the two of you, I think it was you, Dennis, asked me about how it burned down and what we what was known about that. I think you said it, it, I did in '68 because I got pictures and the only picture I got of the place or in the Gazette, right. 1968, they, they burned down. What she wasn't living there. I mean, she she was living there when she was visiting with her husband in New York at the time. It burned in '68, and that was the end. Of it. I think they must have just tore it down and somehow Trusco got hold of that in those years. I, I researched it from. From that event point of view, and as I anticipated, no one on the north end of this unit knew anything about that fire. Um, I referred to you to Stanford, Stanford Heights, Heights, probably covered it. And the one person who would have known um, tragically just passed away this last week. The person mm -hmm. I was coming from, she lives way up north, so I didn't get any information about that fire. And nobody that I knew who was had long uh, historical roots in the town of this unit remembers that event. I'm talking about fire service people, I asked. Maybe a couple of dozen. Was the Albany County line near there? It must have well, been it just past Stanford Heights Fire Department. But was it was it closer to Schenectady at that time? Did it shift? I wonder. Because they almost they, they call it Albany's hottest night spot in a lot of the advertisements, <laughs> yeah. but probably it was just over the line. Mm -hmm. You could go look back at I mean, we don't have many maps. There's 60, 80, 66 map and see, but I. Yeah, Mary Anna pulled some old, really old maps for me. Yeah. And that's where I got the took a picture of where it was, was located. Some of the some of the some of the land north of there became connected, mm -hmm. but I don't I don't know where any changes. Anyway, it must have been the yeah. trolley and bus lines that yeah. changed the stops because they referred in the early ones it was stop six. Which might have been a trolley line, and then it became lower stop numbers after that. Maybe the buses changed the stop number. I don't know. When you switch from trolley in the 40s, they went from trolleys to buses. Yeah. Well, do you, in the follow up to the, the fire, is that something you're going to research with, with Stanford Heights? I guess I could if I, what do you think? I just go there and walk in and ask them? No, I think you could. Like, you'll probably find anybody. I need them to that address. Okay, you sent me an address. I thought I did. Okay, I never know. We'll catch up. Yeah. Okay. Good. With that, I think I'm going to need to duck out, and this was a crazy next four days here. Well, enjoy the reunion. But if you, if I can watch the, I'll watch the tape of this. If you can send it. Should be. Well, I'll be happy to go to the Missy on the Town YouTube. Okay. And should be, I'm not sure how quickly they get put up. But okay. I'll follow the rest of the meeting. I'll there. check with the gentleman recording us here. I That's different. I'll yeah. ask maybe on the way out. Okay. okay. All right. Well, good, good seeing you all. See you and good night. Good, night. good weekend. Um, the only other subcommittee is the prom <laughs> promotional purchase committee. We're going to do any promotional purchases. We had, what is this? November. Uh, home of November. Uh, if we were going to consider some promotional purchases, something we should obviously do in the next two months. Um, still got plenty of pencils. <laughs> um, Michael just walked out. He's on that committee. Um, <laughs> you're on that committee. I am. The, I mean, the thing that we had talked about last was promotional purchases in the context of yesterday. Mm -hmm. 
So can we, what's the takeaway from, from this today with respect to converting into things to give away? I mean, we didn't really do much more than that, but there were conversations about magnets and other types of, of small yeah. items, uh, more than just those of us who use those pencils to do crossword puzzles. Yeah. <laughs> the best pencils in the world. Yeah, I mean, I, and we have a limited amount of money, I think. Maximum we could spend is $200 uh, with permission from the supervisor. And, and uh, so, whatever you might it, 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 can, it can roll over, right? No. Use it or lose it. Yeah. How much is left? Well, maximum we can use is $200. It's certainly that much left. The chances are it's like anything else. If you want to use the $200, you can get less next year. Right. No, budgets. Budget is the same for next year um, as it was for this year, uh, with an additional three thousand dollars for the uh, possibility of a, of a new logo design. Well, and, and, and you know, for promotional uh, items, it, it's, it would tie in well when we get the new logo. Yeah, <laughs> the magnets of the new logo. It would be a good thing to hand out. Well, but that probably won't be till the end of the yeah, year. But we, next won't, year. Uh, we won't have, you know, yeah. you can't let the cart before the horse. Yeah. Well, there's, I mean, the easy escape route from here is just to, to buy more of those pencils. With the notion <laughs> that we, you know, they are a handout item, and people usually take them. But, you know, as far as promoting the committee, you know, I don't know how many people read what's printed on the pencils. But, uh, well, we still have. Several, oh no. <laughs> well, anyway, it's something to consider, I guess, if people want to talk about it, and the subcommittee wants to get together and talk about it. Mm, old business. I don't, uh, I don't, I'm not sure why this is still on here. The fire department aerial photo. Well, we ran into the technical problem of being uh, not able to disassemble that photograph in a safe manner. Mm -hmm. But that's just my personal assessment. So I think where we left it casually last month was if I could get another set of eyes or two on it, who maybe have some greater experience than me on woodworking and so forth. It appears to be a homemade wooden frame. And unlike photographs that you've seen in the past where you pull out a clip or some like brads or nails and it releases what's in the frame and the glass in front of it, this is made much more uh, securely, intending to last for decades, and I guess they achieved that. Mm -hmm. So I am just looking for a way to disassemble the frame, and then once that is done, I can take a photograph, a digital photograph, of that image, and then we can spend the money to get that reproduced. Uh, we agreed in a previous session that taking that whatever that's probably on some print type paper, probably pretty thin, and putting that through a commercial copier was really risky. Yeah. And I didn't feel comfortable in you know handing this to a big, you know, like Knox Big Office mm -hmm. or one of a place like that, and then them saying, Hey, here's your digital thing, but we sort of screwed up the original. So that's where I am. I do have the photograph at home now. I did not restore it to the wall of the fire department with permission of the chief. Uh, the intention was to have it accessible for multiple appearances at the farmer's market. Unfortunately, we only appeared once. We had it. It was there, and it was, as expected, the focal point of people mm -hmm. congregating around our table. Mm -hmm. It's a great, great talking The glass that covers it makes it uh, not feasible to photograph it in the frame? Not by anything that I have tried, because in order to light it correctly, even from the side, there's glare and reflections. It could be done with some degree of degradation. One would think, Judge, your question, that it probably wouldn't be much worse than looking at it now from the glass. And I could certainly try it. But ideally, it would be nice to have that item on, you know, a flat surface, and then I either get above it or whatever, take a bunch of digital photographs, and then reproducing it, we could probably do it with 
pretty inexpensive. Mm -hmm. I think we, in fact, talked about allocating some money for this. So we owed her $50 for a frame. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, the photography is, I, I would just do it. I think come out of the promotional budget. Well, it could come out of the out of the budget, yeah. Wouldn't be promotional, but uh, there's plenty of money in the budget for something. Like that. I did talk to a couple of professional photographers, by the way, on this, and they had the same opinion that they didn't feel comfortable running it through a machine, and they also they said, "Give me the original. If it's under glass, that would be tough." Uh, they're both both people I asked are dispute residents who either were or are professional photographers. So that's where that is. And, and I, like I said, I haven't did my presence. Um, I measured it. It is square. And I can't remember now. I think it's I think it's 28 by 28 or something like that. In that ballpark. Maybe a little bit bigger. So does anybody, I mean, do any of you have any experience with woodworking or anything that would look at it and say, you know, here's what I suggest? I could, I could completely ruin it for you. I know that. Well, uh, no, I have no experience with it. Yeah, I mean, and the, the other thing is, you know, Diana is still in Florida. Um, I'm not sure when she's coming back, but I, mean, I, I know she's having a tough time with her her, her brother's illness. But um, she might be able to find the source of those. Well, I did go to the Schenectady. County map site, yeah. And again, I need some guidance there because I found the maps, but they're in a mosaic, and they present all of the maps as mosaic, but they're not overlapping or abutting each other. There are big gaps between them, and I am not clear whether that's just the way they're presenting them on the website, or whether truly there's no data for all those mm -hmm. positions. So you, you look at it, right? You see, yes, yeah, you know, I, I know what you're talking about. Yeah. Um, it's a really powerful engine that they've got there. And then I tried to print this stuff, and I have no idea how to get high-resolution printed material. That, that would be the ultimate way to do it. If I could get a, a graphic file of some form, ideally a RAW file or a TIFF file or a JPEG file, take it to a printer, and then they print it. So that's, that's the parallel path. I don't know who's the expert on that. I also think there are um, copies of those photos down at the county clerk in gigantic ledgers. I don't know whether they let us copy them. So you're saying it's a paper copy? Yeah, paper copy. In, in the size that we have? Yeah. <coughs> well, they're they're the they're in the section. You know that that big one that we have is several um, photos that have been are, are joined together. What did I brought? The big one. Yeah. Did we determine that that I is, thought it was all one? I may be wrong. Uh, at any rate, I'll have to get down to the I'll have to get down to the county clerk's office and if they're just lying on files down there. Filing down. Because if we could get those, if we had, if we could photograph the original, that would be great. Maybe, maybe you and I could go down to the county clerk's office. Okay. Okay. Well, so we have, so now there are three opportunities here. Taking apart the original photo, maybe finding the one that they have that's already maybe in paper form mm -hmm. and then would be off of the, the mapping website. Mm -hmm. okay. Or if we can find out if those maps are on in the Library of Congress website somewhere. Think about it. If, we can, if we can identify the source of those maps, maybe some of the documents down at the county clerk's office have, have information on the back of it that will lead us to where the, the original The other thing we talked about in relation to that is one of the reasons it attracted us to the mapping software was that's only a small portion of, 
of the town. It's this yeah. area here, mm -hmm. the north, northwest yeah. section. So it would really be nice to be able to get all the adjoining maps that cover the town of this unit. And then maybe we could reconstruct something that is not only uh, educational by looking at it, but it actually is portable enough to bring to events. Mm -hmm. And I'm sure with the ideas we have in the committee, we could come up with a way to do that. So you know, my preference, obviously, would be able to get the data of all the maps that were surrounding mm -hmm. borders of this community yeah. and the town itself, and then put that all together into something. Yeah, that would be really neat. Mm -hmm. Just have to get get to the where, where's the source of the information. Yeah. That's the key. Yep. Yeah. <laughs> Isn't that always the case? Finding the source. Other thing in old business is reviving the senior center interviews. Something that we had talked about literally the day the town shut down. We, yeah. were, we were doing full time the first set of interviews before the, uh, before the pandemic. Um, I don't know whether anybody is interested in taking on that project. I mean, the key is to find people, to identify people who are willing to do it. Not, not us, but well, people in the town who... We have to identify us, people from this committee who are willing to do the interview. Right. Did you, when we talked about this over three years ago, did you envision this being driven by a set of questions? Or was this going to be a microphone and push of the start button and extemporaneous conversation. Anytime you do an oral interview, you should have a list of questions in front of you to start. Um, but ideally, push the button and the person in front of you drives the interview. Um, they have a story to tell, and their story may be driven by one or two questions to start with, but then, then you have to follow up and are you going to, Lead them uh, in. How will this be uh, promoted to, to stimulate participation? Well, we were starting with the senior center. Yeah. And we had a few people who had said we're willing to do it. So you guys have got some starters lined up? Well, we had started yeah. lined up three years ago. Yeah. yeah. And true, not everybody, someone who was comfortable three years ago doing it might not be anymore. Might not be. and. Might not be here either. But yeah, um, but I think I think if if we uh, got something, if we were prepared to move forward, we would probably get some people who would be interested in sitting down. If we put the word out, and we all know some people who have been around. I'm sure, Doug, you know people who have been around town for a long time and wouldn't, yeah. wouldn't mind sitting down and telling their stories. Jet, you probably know some people too, right? Well, you know, Jen Freer is just turning 105. Who's that? Jen Freer. And she lived on um, Loudon Place. She was in the newspaper recently. And she... Um, I saw the article. She, she... I have, you know, spoken to her in a long, long time. But from what I've led to believe that she's very um, cognizant of what's going on. And um, I'm sure she would have a lot of interesting things to share. Um, and if she was willing to share them, I would, I'm, some people just are intimidated by a camera being put in front of them. Uh, if she won't share them. Yeah, I, I think there are certainly people out there who would, if asked or they heard about it, would be willing to step up and say, oh, I I remember when this can only had 10,000 people. And, the, and this is being done at the senior center? We do it at the senior center. We could do it at anybody's home. I mean, we, we've got the, the camera. And someone knows how to use it? Yeah, simple. you do. I do. You, you and uh, that Mike did some. No, I did it on a phone. On a, on a phone. <laughs> oh, you did that on the phone. I can never figure out how to do anything on that camera. Well, yeah, 
uh, the, I've used the camera, so I can certainly show you how to use it. But would you, how would you go about seeking seniors in the community through the newspaper or through? It's the posting up down there or something. Well, but in the newspaper, if you put an article, even with the gleanings, if you attached, um, everybody's reading the gleanings um, to attach um, People. You could do you could do a gleanings article about the value of having these oral interviews and recording people's memories. I mean, that, that could be the point of one gleanings article, and get people to. So I think that's a great idea. That is a good idea. And um, once we're set up and ready to go, once we're prepared to move forward. And if, even if we had two or three. Uh, individuals in the Gleanings article that were seniors that were able to contribute some thoughts about, you know, oldness Yuna, that it, that might make people surface. Yeah, uh, that would that would be, that's a great idea. To, even if you didn't record them, to interview them about some story and you could have two or three stories about old times in this Yuna. That might attract other people to participate. So I think there's ways of getting people involved. Mm -hmm. I have to be prepared to move forward. My sense is that this is something that would, uh, I would say, snowball, but I think you interview one person and then that conversation gets to another person, maybe in a similar age group and mm -hmm. so forth. Um, and using the senior center staff itself to talk to the seniors who's, who are members there is also a way you could probably encourage me. You don't necessarily do it there, but mm -hmm. I, I know somebody on the staff. Ironically, the, the gentleman who I mentioned who just passed away was a member of our art department. His daughter is a staff member mm -hmm. of the senior center. And uh, I'm sure when they meet, she could just say, hey, is anybody interested in this? Well, yeah, then that's where we were going yeah. three years ago. Yeah, three years the ago, senior center right. staff had been had been very helpful, and I had gone out and talked about it and gotten some people who were willing to start uh, to do an interview. Could those so, people be revisited? Um, I'm not. Um, if I if they're still there, yeah. Does anybody know if? Mrs. Frederici still on? No, I don't. I don't. I think she might be, and I know her son lives with her. And I know my dad was a great one to share stories about, you know, the trolley and the development of Troy Road. Not specifics, per se, but um, we got to look at some old folks. Yeah. The, the other thing I would, would point out with respect to comfort of the person who's being interviewed, you, you made a reference to it earlier. We, we also purchased a, a microphone that can be remoted by the distance so the camera can be far away. And there's no compelling reason. Uh, to use video. It could all be done with just audio. Uh, the video adds certainly an obvious element to any face-to-face -face conversation. But there are, I mean, even that recorder, you could just record the audio and not even bother with the video. You could put it by the side. Or there are very, very inexpensive audio recorders. Mm -hmm. You've seen them on TV. You know, they put it down in front of a person and put the start. Most, most of us have one in our pocket right now. A phone will, a phone will do it, absolutely. It, it would absolutely do it. The, the ones that I'm speaking of are more designed for that kind of thing mm -hmm. than a phone is, but to, to your point, Judd, yeah. uh, 
we have the capability. I mean, in theory, we could use the phone even for the video part. True. So the mechanics of it, I think, are easily manageable. And then you use the camera, so yeah. it's straightforward, really. You turn it on and push, push record. And most people, when I was doing it at Union College, most people tend to seem to forget the camera on after maybe an initial period of some. And the good ones, like I said, we've done interviews, we were doing 45 minute interviews, and sometimes you, <laughs> you had to stop them because they'd start telling stories and just keep snowball. The one that you said was in the wings ready to go before COVID, did, was there any preparation work done for that interview? I mean, like basic questions and things of that nature? Um, yes, but yeah, and I'll have to go back and play. I, I, have, some, I have something in class. You know. Okay, that may, yeah. that may yeah. be useful if you have a moment. Yeah, yeah. No, some basic, some basic questions are, are good to have, yeah. you know, um, especially if you know something about the person you're interviewing in advance, how long they lived here, whereabouts in the town did they live, or what kind of a job maybe they had. So some basic background questions that uh, give you some person some uh, connection begin the interview in many cases it's just a matter of setting them in motion okay. and then following up yeah. my sense is that this is the kind of thing where we're happy since nobody's done it yet we're sort of sitting here in this nervous mm -hmm. land i think after the first one we learn from that, make, you know, make course corrections right away, and then from then on, you just identify people and arrange to meet with them. I would think that would be the way it would go. So I think we have to overcome that initial. Well, we could go. Beverly, Tosha, has done a lot of her own interviews, well, and I'm sure did. she'd be happy that she she would be willing to come in and sit down and talk to us about the process she's used and uh, how to. Uh, how to make it work? Her experience in there. Beverly Clark is the uh, historian for the village of Scotia. Mm -hmm. She's part of this crazy team we have doing mm -hmm. the, the county historical presentations for Union College. So that's great mm -hmm. that yeah. she has that experience. Okay. All right. The one item I have on new business. I have a new business. Anybody else has any new business? Certainly, welcome to bring it up. Um, it was a question about the um, this comprehensive plan. Um, they do a comprehensive plan every ten years. The last one was 2013. Now we're doing one, beginning to organize one for 2023. Uh, and at the last, last meeting, which was earlier this week, um, there was a lot of discussion about what kind of questions. How do you? What kind of input do we want from? residents you know, about Niskayuna. Why do you live in Niskayuna? Uh, and also about the type of questions. Do we want to ask open-ended questions or do we want to ask yes or no questions or do we want to ask evaluation questions, you know, rate on a scale of one to ten or here's a list of possible improvements to Niskayuna, which do you think is the most important and which is the least important. Um, so I just thought today, if anybody has any ideas, any thoughts about what kind of questions you might want to ask, what so you think might be appropriate to, I'm on that committee, so. I, so the idea is to get a feeling for how people see the town today and where they would like to see the town headed. Yeah. And, and these are going to be sort of field uh, uh, or are we going to hand out uh, questions? There is going to be, there is going, uh, as we go out into the neighborhoods, we meet people and chat with them. There'll be you know, the field interviews, you might say. Uh, might go to, um, they haven't organized this all yet. We might go to, I don't know, Lions Clubs or some, some, some meetings uh, and, and uh, interview people at, at meetings. Uh, there will be a questionnaire that I hope to mail out to everyone, see if they get people to respond, mm -hmm. or um, a uh, digital uh, questionnaire 
go out there. Not everybody is up on the digital, so some of them, uh, they're hoping to be able to mail, mail it out to everybody as well as doing the digital. Uh, and it's a whole question about how many questions. You don't want to make it too long to make it too much. People look at it and say, I haven't got time to answer these four pages of questions. But if, if somebody like me wanted to look at the 2013 comprehensive plan, uh, where is that, in the library? They have copies of that? It, it's, uh, it's on the website. It's on the website? It's on the website, yeah. You can... Um, Will make me a, a liar out of me, but I'm almost positive it's on the website. Uh, if it's not, I'll check to see whether it's on the website or not. If it's not, I can send it to you. I've got a copy of it, um, but it's certainly available. I'm almost positive it's on the town website. And if, if, if having looked that over, how much of uh, what was in that plan has been realized? Good question. Uh, <laughs> um, I'd say I don't know the, the, the exact number. Certain, certain, certainly some parts of it have been realized. Some parts are still not realized. And some parts may, may have, you know, as time goes on, may have become, you know, mm -hmm. either unrealizable or not, not necessary to be realized. Yes. Yeah. I know there were, I, I don't remember off the top of my head, but I do know um, there were a lot of traffic issues that we try to address. These things, we'd like to fix these over the next 10 years. Uh, and I know some of them have been fixed, some of them have. Uh, but I don't Just know. Throw a rotary at it. Other. Pardon? Just throw a rotary at it. <laughs> I think the, I think the, uh, the, 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 the uh, circle at the, at the bridge was on the 2013. I just realized to go on my computer here. I'll take a look. Um, but, you know, why did you choose to live in the town of Miskina? Why did you choose to live in the town of Miskina? Oh, right. Yeah. Me? Right. I mean, is well, that all? Good. I chose to live in the town of Miskina. I was being transferred. Uh, from a, a job that I had with a, a bank on, in the metropolitan New York area. And I was being transferred up to take over uh, the New York operation of a company called Northeast Savings. And Northeast Savings had previously been known as the Schenectady Savings Company. And it made sense to me uh, for a number of reasons that it was important to live in the county of Schenectady. And it, as I looked at different houses and different places, when I looked at a few in this unit, I found one that just was perfect for my family and I, and so there we are. And still there, low these 32 years later. <laughs> um, why was it perfect? I mean, just price, size? Neighborhood, schools, yeah. uh, and it just had a great... It felt like home. Does Miss Gina still feel like home? I don't mean to put you on the spot. I'm sorry, what was the last question? Does, does it still feel like home? Yeah, I'm still there. Yeah. Um, all right. The um, If you go to the town website, if you do in the search box, yeah. comprehensive plan, and it will direct you to it. So it's there. Um, at any rate, I, I'm, I'm just bringing it up because if anybody has any suggestions about, you know, what you think would be useful, something I can bring back to that committee in terms of a, a question to ask or a, an approach to. Well, I think it would be interesting to, to hear a variety of people's perceptions of, you know, sort of, if you were telling somebody about this scheme, how would you describe it? Mm -hmm. And, and, yeah. hear, and hear the different uh, uh, iterations of that. 
I think you alluded to this in your one of your early questions, Joe, but to what degree historically have comprehensive plans in this town actually influenced <laughs> outcomes and decisions? I mean, the decisions are made in the chairs that we're sitting in right now. Is there a sense, either among people at the end or the community, that their input actually influences decisions that are made, you know, big decisions, like do we want it to be more residential, less business, you know, do we want to invite bigger business? Um, you know, there, there are big questions and there are small questions. Mm -hmm. There's sidewalks and there's police and there's fire and there's all these other things. So do people feel that they, if they answer such a questionnaire that they really are contributing to this process or not? Are you being heard? Sorry. Are you being heard? Yeah. I mean, yeah. Does anybody know that answer? I'm not familiar enough with the process. Same question people ask when they come to stand the podium in front of the town. Yeah, good point. Yeah. yeah. No, but I think it's a good question to ask. Because if, it, if you have a negative view of local government, you could just put this all under this is lip service and being done mm -hmm. for show. To me, it's a feel good thing. We're, we're letting you come up and grab the microphone and talk, but really, we don't care. Uh, I'm not that cynical, but because I don't have any data either way, I don't know how comprehensive the principle is, but I think it would be something in this day and age that anybody who participates in the process is going to want to know more of than they ever did before. Mm -hmm. If I'm going to invest my time and share my opinion, other than the voting booth, does any of this mean anything? So. Am I being too cautious here, or do you think there's reason to be concerned? No, I, I, I think you're right. I think that, that people being asked to uh, participate and give, give their opinions or their, their thoughts on some of these things, many of them will think, well, yeah, okay, but this is going to go nowhere. This is going to gather dust on the, uh, on the shelf next to the 2013 comprehensive plan and the 2003 comprehensive plan and so on and so forth. And I, and I would add that I don't look at it, if I was contributing and I had a point of view on the plan and a decision counter to my point of view was made, I would be okay with that, with that as long as I understood that there was a lot of input and most of the input was not in line with what I thought. But if it's being dismissed, you know, out of hand than what you said, right? I mean, it, it makes it, you know, it takes away local government from the people who it serves. And, and, and the plans are, 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 are great, but of course the day-to-day, -day, the, the, the issues and, and, and uh, uh, policy decisions that have to be made that come before the town, whether it be a committee or, or the town board or, or the supervisor's office or whatever it happens to be, uh, you know, that's going to always take precedence over, well, let's go back and revisit the comprehensive plan and, you know, we'll just, you know, turn the rudder and get the ship going in the direction that we you know, had planned it for it to go. You know. Do you Do have my to know this, whether a comprehensive plan is a mandate on towns or is this discretionary? I, I don't know, certainly, the, the certainty of the answer to that question. My understanding is not a mandate. It's a you know, the ideals about where we would want to go. It were made 10 years ago at this point in time. So maybe that, as Judd was saying, maybe they're no longer feasible or they don't are ne not necessary anymore. <clears throat> so there's no mandate that we put this in the plan and it has to be done. Um, no, I'm saying, but do it, is there a mandate to actually go through the motion of, a, of developing a comprehensive plan, not implementing what's in the plan? You know, I don't even know that for sure, but I know all the town around here do it. Okay. So I don't know, but I don't know that it's directed from, from the state or something like that. I do also know that there is, there is, in my experience, my brief experience the last three or four years here, uh, there is certainly an effort on the part of the planning board, planning people, people or Robertson and other people, to pay attention to the plan, the comprehensive plan, and where they're going. That, that is a does, is an objective that they try to stick to. Okay, well, that's, that's a, so, an energizing yeah. element right yeah. there. Right. I, I've seen that over and over again. And, you know, 
it may be that you know we want to do this we can't get there right now but there, you know, there is there is attention to that plan so um now the question is whether what you ask you know what you would like to see happen gets into the plan to begin with because you, know, you were just one person who wanted this a stop sign at this street <laughs> And nobody else was, was interested in something like that. So yeah, there is there is the possibility. That, you know, oh, I want it. this really needs to happen, but it doesn't even exist because it's not there's not enough groundswell support. But they're trying to find out what what the, the broader thing that people want to happen. You make the road safer. So as a historical committee, in your opinion, as a story. How do you feel that the comprehensive plan effort and what we do cross? Is it promotional or is there something <laughs> of substance no, there that is, you're thinking about? If, if you read the comprehensive plan, there is a section on what we want to do historically. It was one. Okay. I was I was talking more broadly about questions you would want to I was just trying to you know pick your minds about questions you would thought might be useful in, in terms of broader understanding of what people want. Down. Um, at another point in time, we could consider, and I would, if we could read that the historical section. There's only about seven or eight pages of it, um, to see what they wanted to accomplish ten years ago in terms of historic preservation and whether it was accomplished, and what we would want to do moving forward. I think that's. Uh, I was planning on that being a discussion for another another meeting. Um, once people had an opportunity to read it. And they did, you know, they did accomplish some of what was in the, the historical ideas of the historical section of the Comprehensive Plan for 2013. Most recently, the Preservation Commission took nine years and six months. <laughs> but, I mean, it did get done. And moving forward on that, what the next step is going to be. Do more about preservation or whatever. But that's something else we I think we consider another meeting. I was thinking I would probably send the whole committee a copy of that, at least that section of the conference plan, so it can be a, a discussion that <coughs> perhaps at our next month's meeting. Mm -hmm. there's, there's an aspect of something of a comprehensive plan that pops in my head, which is that such a plan, which is probably different than other types of planning, can can uh, represent pertinent negatives. It can make mm -hmm. statements about what the town does not want to do. So you know, usually you try to you know only talk about the things that you want to want to do and move forward. But negatives that's a place where we could have concern because a negative could be uh, you know we want to tear down old bu buildings <laughs> and that's <laughs> counter to historical yeah. preservation. Mm -hmm. um, so I mean that's a trivial example. So, so there's a lot of interesting opportunities there too. I think there's only four of you. Right? No, no, but I'm just, <laughs> but I'm just saying yeah. that what percentage moved to this unit because their grandparents lived in Schenectady on Union Street, and they decided they didn't want to be on Union Street any longer. They wanted to move out to Troy Road versus family that. lived here because their father went to work for General Electric and then they moved out to Niskuna. Um And what percentage of us are there here in Niskuna 
that are historical residents versus the transfers. Mm -hmm. And that would that would be interesting. It would be interesting to know, and I don't know if those statistics I mean, are already. Is there only twenty five percent of the Niskean population, like Chuck Lester and I, who historically live in this unit, not for any other reason than because our families were from Schenectady. That's the only reason we're here, is because we were from Schenectady. From Schenectady or Niskayuna? No. From Niskayuna became populated because families in Schenectady didn't choose to live there any longer. They wanted to move outside oh. of Schenectady um, and it became attractive because I remember my father saying that there was the trolley cars that went from Schenectady to Troy and uh, the Troy Schenectady Road <clears throat> was attractive. And, and, the properties, and the properties and the farm properties were out here. So it's not just about people moving to Nisniona, I don't think. I think it's more about historically where our grandparents or great grandparents lived because they lived in Schenectady, or they lived in Rexford, or they lived... They lived locally, at any rate. Right. And that would be a, an interesting statistic, I think, to um, see how many of us are direct descendants of people who historically lived here three generations ago. Or where, where did they come from? Um, because is there 75% of us, not me, moved to Niskayuna only 50 years ago because they worked for the Knowles or General Electric or some such industry? Or were our families working for Elko. I and think it all stems from Schenectady, or to my way of thinking. That's why I feel such um, a direct tie. Um, well, I have a direct tie to Schenectady, but I have a direct tie to Niskiona because I remember how it became developed. I remember um, just recently, I was at 2500 Troy Road, where I was raised. And people that live there now, um, I was on the property, and I can remember as a, a young child, camping out at the corner of Pearson Troy Road in a tent. I mean, that's how rural it was. Yeah. But your family moved from Schenectady City? Yes. To Genesee. My grandfather was a medical doctor on Union Street. And he decided that he wanted to build a, a home outside of the city, which is right, right there at the Lysha Hill, across from Avon yeah. Press North. And um, then my father built seven more houses on Troy Road. But um, I think that would be um, a source of information to be able to track back. I, Chuck, I, think I don't know, Chuck, if historically you had the place on Troy Road because of the trolley. The trolley wasn't there when they moved in. 
when the motors are numbered. The tracks are still there, but the trolleys weren't operating anymore. That's 1942. But how was it that um, you had you had a, a, a business there? Right. My grandfather ran a restaurant. My grandfather had a restaurant in West Burn, that's where we came from. And you know, he bought and sold that place that came to this to run that restaurant. So that's a, a very interesting source to figure why they came to Disguna. Why did he come to Disguna? Like I have a great uncle who raised his family in the stockade. And they never wanted to move away from Schenectady. I mean, there were so many opportunities here. I mean, there was eight of them, but they all were from Schenectady. They all moved out to Miskeona because that's what had happened, what, only, what, 40 years ago. People all went from Schenectady and they went to Clifton Park. Well, I think, uh, I'm not sure how detail we could get in this in this effort, but I think it would be interesting to if you could put some sort of a statistic together or some sort of get some sort of information about the number of people who came who are from the area generally and have remained in have remained in this scheme, something like I mean what was the focus? Well there was the focus Niskiana was just a beautiful place, or was it because of the Troy Schenectady Road, or was it because of, well, I mean, there's see. so many other things that, that made them immigrant to Niskiana. Yeah, it, it, urb, uh, urbanization versus suburbanization. And uh, that, that you know, certainly in the early 19th century, that was happening in a lot of places. Escaping the, the ugly, evil city. Well, it wasn't evil back then. But yeah. for whatever reason, they decided they wanted to not be on Union Street. Yeah. They wanted someplace... Fresh air, or whatever you want, what I want to call. Uh, okay. Um, anybody have any other thoughts or any other new business? I do. Go for it. Um, you know, I've sort of been involved with trying to do some kind of historic preservation in this town for, I'm trying to think back to the first thing I ever did, which was a little grassroots organization that. Myself, my daughter, and a few of her childhood friends in the Stanford area. We wanted to help to preserve the Stanford Cemetery over there because it looked run down, it wasn't well taken care of by the town. There's some bad stuff in the town board that we wanted to take care of the grass and do stuff over there. My daughter, which I said I was going to contact somebody as far as repairing some of the stones there because they were knocked over. I got denied. I got involved with Stanford Mansion, trying to protect that, keep that from getting destroyed. I was very much involved with that, probably more than I should have been, you know, that I think that guy, because it ended up putting me in a bad place. That ended up falling by the wayside. I joined this committee pretty much since the inception to try to save the homes that I thought were worth saving in this town. It's didn't happen. And as far as I'm concerned, what's going on with the music house and recovering the siding and stuff like that, that's not, this is never my, not anything my thought. I thought maybe if they're going to restore it, it would have been to restore it as it was, not covering it all up and changing it the way they're going to it. And what's going on with the music house is, it is I'm just pissed off about it. I've accomplished pretty much nothing. That's what everything I've tried to do and be involved with trying to 
historic preservation in this town. And then you deny to, to, to be on the committee for the historic preservation thing. That's the end of the line. I'm probably done for this committee. I'm going to be able to try to do this stuff. Maybe I'll get back involved with it with a future date or something. But you know, I feel like it's all been a waste of my time. Well, um, I'm sorry to hear that. Uh, I hear your frustration. Uh, I understand, certainly, after all the, the efforts. Not, not, not finding any, any uh, success. I don't know why you would feel that. Uh, hope maybe you'll at least reconsider. Stick with us for a while, if not the, not the rest of the town, but with people. But, uh, I guess that I can certainly understand the frustration. But the music house, weren't we all led to believe that by definition it wasn't a historical designation? Was as far as I was concerned. Huh? It no, as far as, as No, and I and I agree with you that but it got away from us. And it was sold. And it wasn't. How were we supposed to have it restored? Or how were we able to claim it back? Well, we Chuck? Could, I thought we could. We were under the impression that we could have protected it from being systemized, as far as I'm concerned. <laughs> there was there was no way to protect. Uh, there was no way to protect. I, I mean, I, I don't know. My intentions. Hmm? My, my thoughts were to, to try to do that. Yeah, but I mean, until the preservation code in April, if somebody wanted to demolish that house. They all they had to do was ask yes, for, for, for a demolition. Well, I said that's why. That's pretty much what I got involved. Mm -hmm. Do we, we hope, I hope, that we're moving painfully slowly in another direction, but it's, it's not going to Well, I wish all the luck to the committee, and I, you know, I hope that the, the historic preservation committee does well, too. I mean, I really, I really do. I mean, I really hope that the things that have been happening in this town, as far as the demise of the story. You know, I've been involved with the Alco Historicals, the Technical Society now, because we're trying to preserve the history of the Alco and Schenectady. Schenectady wants nothing to do with it. So, I mean, it's, it's just getting to that point in this world that you know, nobody cares about the history. I mean, I know we do. But, you know, yeah, the people that sit in these tables, these chairs, I'm down more care. I really don't. I, I, at the end of the day, I always go back to the official title of this group, which is advisory. <laughs> you know, so no power, right? I mean, none of us have power. All we can do is plant seeds and bug in people's ears. And I hear your story, yeah, Joe. For 15 years. Yeah, I mean, if you've been doing it as long as you have, which I sort of do, I really get how you feel frustrated. Um, you know, the vehicles to get things done go through so many steps, and there are so many competing elements of it. And maybe you're right. I mean, if it doesn't have a dollar sign associated with it, either don't spend money to lose it, or it's going to make money to get it, then it gets lost in conversation. Um, you know, but, there are um, a lot of people who just don't see the value in historical preservation right. because it doesn't do anything other than educate. And I for one have to agree with you that I think it's critical, but that's not at least some of the people I observe and what motivates what motivates is is the business going to come in and generate tax revenue and make money and, and do whatever the other things are that a town thinks are important. Goals of the company is <laughs> However, well, Chuck, you have to admit that we became champions many years ago when we even being involved with Troy Road when we, we we retained to the residential um, 
And the thing was that Troy Road did not go commercial. And that was a battle. That was a very close, that was a very close battle when it came down to the vote. But we were able to at least have that to remember. And we worked very hard for that. And sometimes you win, sometimes you lose. But I sympathize with you when I look at the Cregeer House or I look at the Music House. Um, you always like to think that people are going to do um, what we think is a logical thing as far as preservation. I mean, I was just on my property on Troy Road at 2500. It's hardly a preservation of what was there. You know, things change, and you can't do anything about it. And, um, <laughs> no, no, but I'm just saying, I'm just saying that it. I always like to think there's something you can do about it, and that's what I tried. But we have been champions in the past, and we'll have to find ourselves another logical battle to find. Well, yeah. Unfortunately, you might say we have to be uh, accepting of, of small, small benefits, small successes uh, here and there. The preservation code, I think, a long time coming. Small victory because the truth of the matter is, somebody wants to tear down a house that they go through all the processes that are in the preservation code, and chances are they'll get to tear it down eventually anyway. But slow the process down a little. Maybe we begin to make some some difference. And maybe make the the, the, the property owners begin to think differently about yeah. the property itself. It's time time to hopefully maybe change the mind. Yeah. That's well, critical. Well, that's, critical. <laughs> that's critical, Joe, because if you if you try to back off from the whole thing, take the emotion out of it. You've got a property owner, for instance, who sees something where they, out of their pocketbook, have got to invest a huge amount of money just to preserve the property, to make it livable or whatever they want. And then I would think that if that got into a court, that is a very uh, strong argument. That the, you know, why should I, as an owner, want to be burdened financially? So it's, once again, money versus a more abstract concept, which is preservation, history, education and so forth. And, you know, I guess what you're saying in your experience, Chuck, is that in general, money's going to win out. Um, and it's not necessarily the money that's right in front of you. It's if you allow somebody to not be burdened with money, then they're the, they're the next voter that may support you or support the tax base of the town. It, it, it's almost like talking about religion. Right? I mean, everybody's got their idea of what it is, and they're probably not going to be moved by it. Uh, they just, you know, the question is, can you build a society in which people tolerate it all as a compromise? So, in the end, I don't know that anybody on the committee ever thought that whatever the total of objectives were, that we'd be able to achieve it all. I mean, guess what you're saying is we should take at least some pleasure and measure of success in those things that have been accomplished. You are way more invested than most of us. I was so happy to know that they wanted to establish this committee. And then when it came where the town had to have their hand in, that's when it sort of, sort of well, I lost a little bit right there. But then we've still been able to accomplish this. You can't take the town out of it. Well, I know, but yeah. the town it's shouldn't have the last say. The town works in Iowa, I say, well, we just need this as a committee. I mean, the, the town historian has never been under the hand of the town board before until this, until this committee was developed. So, I mean. And I think Gleanings has been astronomically successful. But if you remember the, on the little banner that you had made and on our pencils, 
in addition to educate, there was preserve. preserve. And there are several other things. And, you know, I think there were four yeah. action items on there. And so some, to your point, Jed, have been very successful. I hear nothing but wonderful things about all the articles that all of you have written. Um, but at the end of the day, that's not going to well, I can't say that. I mean, maybe somebody reads a couple of leanings articles and then looks at a house in their neighborhood and sees that it's going through this dilemma, and they convert what they've read and see what this committee does. It's, it's a complicated problem. And you have to remember that when we started three years ago, there were 17 or 18 people in the room, mm -hmm. and there's only six really active people now. One, two, three, four, Michael, you, Jet, um, and maybe maybe you can, know when she's around. You know, we yeah. haven't you yeah. know the, some of the people who are in the education part of our thing just have been burdened with family and mm -hmm. their jobs and they're still on. So and I don't know whether people left because they were frustrated or they didn't have the time or whatever. We didn't really have an exit survey. Well again, it's not and it's not just this organization. It's a board member of the Technical Society. Anybody come out here? Can anybody get involved with that? But I think, you know, it always is a slow process. And I think that the committee should be commended for as much as they've done. I personally did not interpret your frustration and your desire to resign as a comment on the committee, it was very focused on this one very important element of what we advised the town to do. And over that time, from where we started to today, it's really morphed. Um, you know, the town now has this their own committee. I mean, I see what you're saying is that it seems like they, you know, they're having their tentacles into a lot of things that we consider. But that's the way government works. We don't have any authority to do anything. All we have is the ability to educate ourselves, debate, come to cons some consensus, and advise. It's what happened with the logo. I mean, I'm not I'm not crawling over the fact that the town's got a logo committee, but I wasn't sitting here thinking that we were actually going to end up being the group that we designed it. I was hoping that we could, using the schools and things that we had all talked about. But at the end of the day, as soon as people in town government get a sense of that. It's their natural inclination to jump in and say, oh, we'll take care of that. And it's, it's just not a negative comment. It's just, I think, the reality of, of the gap. You know, I mean, it's. Yeah, I mean, the, <laughs> this is where all the authority comes from. I mean, the final decision making comes from here, whether we like it or not. We can advise all we want. <coughs> and, you know, in terms of preservation, the town board gets the final decision at the end of the line. No matter what the preservation commission decides, the town board has to. Give it stamp approval, yeah. Yeah. and you know that that's just the, the way the system we live under. Well, it's frustrating yeah, it's supposed to be based on the fact that the seven, seven people who sit up here are elected by us, so they are supposed to be our voice mm -hmm. as citizens, not this committee, but as citizens. But again, I mean, I I have never gotten to a point where I thought that the creation of this committee was placating our. You know our town historian, and, and, and I thought they <laughs> legitimately thought we could contribute something, and I still believe that. I have no reason to not believe it, but I get it. So. All right. Just a comment. Well, I made it last last month. You know when we were at the uh, at the farmers market, our table was very popular, and we only do the challenges of people being available. We were only able to do it once this year. We had a great spot, actually, right? It's, people came from the parking lot. There we were. Um, and you know the, I can't remember the name of the publisher, but the publisher that does the sepia town books, so they have one on the town of this unit. Yeah. And every, you know, I would bring mine, and, and Dennis would bring his, and people say, oh, I'd love to have that book. And we've been talking for a year and a half about how to sell them there, and it's just too tricky. Guess where they're available for sale? Right up at the CBS on Balltown Road, and they have like 15 of them. <laughs> They have one of those racks that turns yeah. around, and they have yeah. probably, I would say, 15 different titles yeah. in that series, Connected, AG, Pot. 
So I'm just making the comment to all of you that if you encounter somebody who said, I'd love to get that book, they don't even have to go to the open door. They can go right <laughs> up to the CBS. And I was thinking that if we do the farmer's market yet next year, I wouldn't be, I wouldn't have a problem with maybe buying a couple of copies out of my pocket and just exchanging them. I, I think that wouldn't be breaking any rules from the standpoint of a town sale. I'm doing uh, it. I don't know. <laughs> Anyway, I just thought you'd like That's to know that, that this yeah. unit book is at the CBS Pharmacy in Bolton. We don't do it in front of me. So. <laughs> All right. I have a motion to. So, you, know, you can just adjourn. Adjourn? Yes. All right. We are adjourned. Thank you very much. Thank, Thank you, Mr. <laughs> sitting in for that.